Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Ram, Jam with Ram. Uh, you know this series where I answer the questions you guys make in the uh, previous video of Jam with Ram. Um, it's been a long while since a regular Jam with Ram has gone up. Um, it was back in Christmas actually. Uh, well. Mm, Christmas has been a very busy time for me, I couldn't actually record a lot. So that's mostly why it hasn't happened again until now. Also, <clears throat> with the 10k coming so close, I didn't make a regular uh, Jump with Ram last week. But well, it's time to come back to the schedule of the regular weekly Monday Jump with Rams. Um, first thing I have to say is that uh, I have uh, played War Thunder again. Yes, the other day, if last uh, Friday, there was a subscriber special. It was a ton of fun. Expect to see a video about that in the following days. Uh, we had several just for fun games, and in the end, I held a competition between the four highest scorers or of our first battle. So they could fight each other, and the winner of the playoffs, so to speak, would fight me. Actually, in the end, I fought two of them, but you will see why when the video goes up. And actually, the winner of the competition, the guy who won um, uh, the right to fight versus me, actually <laughs> totally kicked my ass. So you are going to see that as well in the video. It's it was a really, really, really nice fight. You are, I'm sure you are going to enjoy it a lot, uh, because it includes one of the best maneuvers I have ever seen pulled on me in War Thunder. Um, well, uh, remember that probably not this week because it's going to be a little bit tough, but probably for next week uh, I will hold another event um, that you will be able to join and we will have some fun together. Um, really is worth it. We had a lot of fun. So, yeah, that's it for uh, what's um, mostly the intro and speaking just in general about what's happened last week. Uh, nothing new in any other front. Uh, still, I'm not in the ground forces um, uh, beta and I don't hold my breath. I'm, I require an invite to get in there and I know I'm not going to get invited, so whatever. Um, as for the rest, well, life goes on and videos are being uploaded. <laughs> so yeah, let's go into the questions. First question is, can you recommend anything similar to pre 1.37 War Thunder? Uh, sadly, no. Um, that's one of the things that really saddens me the most about War Thunder. Uh, it was so un unique, it was so amazing in the sense that it mixed it very well um, the tastes of those guys who just want something casual and they can fly arcade and uh, who want a little bit more, um, a more realistic approach and then you would go to historical battles. Sadly with all the changes that has, uh, have been happening last month, um, that's uh, slowly fading away. It's more and more for the casual gamer. Um, I don't know any other game like this. And that's the pity. That's what's sad. Uh, that this game has the potential to make air simulations um, attractive and interesting for the mass uh, consumer base. But, well, Gaijin has gone, chosen to go a different way, so whatever. Um, as for something similar to this, the other day I was looking for uh, green lighted uh, projects in Steam. And since that, the creator of the original Red Baron, um, the World War II flight team of the 90s, is working on another Red Baron. And for what I could see, the concept was very, was, was very, very similar to that of War Thunder. Uh, but that's months away. Uh, the estimated release date was November of this year. So, and also it's World War One, which doesn't make it so attractive for me. But when it comes out, I'll pro of course I will try it out, and you probably will see some of that game in, in this channel. Um, as for mm, other games right now, really no, there are no other games like that right now. And that's the sad thing, that something so great is being dumped down so much. 
Well, that's the way things go. <laughs> what are you going to say? Uh, next one. Hey Ram, can you explain the we weapon conversion at ranges? How it affects the gun's firepower and the different ammo belts? What they do in the uh, in the mix to the pain? I actually have um, a video about ammo and uh, ammo belts. Uh, was uh, released shortly after the actual ammo belt choices were available for the planes. Uh, I will try to dig it out and put a, li a description, a link um, in the description and also in in the um, in the um, oh, annotations of this video, so you can visit it and take a look. Um, other than that, it's really a complicated thing. Uh, there are a lot of uh, ammunition to explain, and I already done that video, so yeah, just go to that, take a look, and if you have more questions, well, feel free to ask. Uh, next question. What do you think about Rise of Flight? And do you think you will fly that while you're still away from War Thunder? I understand you don't like B playing so much, but it's pretty much the only multiplayer sim you might be interested in. Um, well, let's answer that by parts. Um, Rise of Flight is a great simulator for all I have seen. But again, it's World War One. It's not something I'm really hugely interested in. Um, for those of you who don't know, because I answered this in other uh, Young with Run some months ago, uh, the problem with World War One planes is that they turn in time, and l in quite some cases, literally so. I mean, um, rot those planes who which have uh, rotary engines, uh, I mean, there were some planes where the act the engine actually rotated. And that was a huge mass rotating in the inside of a plane. And uh, if you know a little bit about physics, you will know that there's something called the gy gyroscopical effect. And uh, the gyroscopical effect on those planes was massive. Because they were very light and the engine was the heaviest part and it was rotating. So mm, the planes with a rotating uh, engine literally could swivel of their axis. The camel, particularly so, was a plane renowned that, uh, for when turning to the right, literally turning on the spot. Um, which this means is that angle fighting is much more important than energy fighting and boom and zoom. Of course, you can boom and zoom, you can energy fight, but the planes don't have enough firepower to make one pass kills unless you are lucky and kill the pilot. Um, and the, the maneuverability is so great that really the emphasis is more in who is able to get faster on the other guy six i mean it's it has a lot less of what i like in air combat the chess part where you are as smart in your opponent world war one planes is mostly about turn 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 and acm of course um and it's too quick for my taste so no i'm not going to try rise of flight um, it's a great simulator, don't take me wrong, but it's not a style of air combat that I enjoy. As for the other, par uh, other part of the question where you said where well, I'm going to fly while War Thunder is, is out of the question, which probably will be forever, <laughs> um, right now I don't have any urgency to do so. I mean, I am a passionate guy when it comes to air simulators and air games, but it's not the only kind of game I enjoy. You can see that because I play World Game Mirror Battle, I play Gunpoint, I play Faster Than Light, I play Automation, I play a lot of games. Uh, strategy related games are also my, pas well, my passion, I like them a lot. I'm not passionate, uh, as passionate about any other kind of game as much as simulators, but I like a lot of different style of games. So it's not really a case of I'm quitting War Thunder, I need another air simulator to fix the the need of flying, um, because I like a lot of games. Actually, when I was, when, when I decided I was going to stop flying War Thunder, for a moment and for a while I was thinking about maybe making a comeback to Ace's High. Uh, a game I have really fond uh, memories about and which I haven't flown for 8 years, maybe. Um, may happen in the future, but not right now. Because one of the things that War Thunder has done to me is to get me burnt out. 
Uh, it's not that I just don't have fun with War Thunder, it's that really I am... I look at the prospect of playing anything and it's like, no, no, I, I, I don't really want to. <laughs> uh, so probably I will come back to Ace High maybe in a couple of months and you will see of it, of course, in, in the channel. Uh, and pro will be interesting as well because that will be probably the first time a lot of you will m see me flying with a proper HOTA setup. I mean, stick, throttle, rudders, and track a year. Because it's the way you fly a proper flight simulator. And SSI is a proper flight simulator. Uh, also, it's cockpit only views, no 3D person view, and nothing of that. So, yeah, it might be interesting from the point of view of the channel. But right now I really don't feel like it. I really don't. Um, and until I really feel the need and I really want to and I really want to do it, I'm not going to. Uh, but once I feel like doing it, it's going to be great. I know it. Uh, so yeah, right now I'm not flying anything, basically. The, the closest I have come to an air combat game, uh, excession made of the... Um, super event uh, last uh, Friday uh, is where I get Maryland battle with planes, of course, but that's a strategy game, you don't fly them. So, yeah, um, right now I don't have any, I don't feel any need to come back to planes. Right now, not. Uh, it will happen, of course, but at this moment I'm just, just getting all the bad mood out of my self um, after the bad experience with War Thunder. Uh, next question. I wonder, Ram, what will happen with the podcast you and Bismarck uh, would do once a week now? Well, actually, the podcast was put on hold after the failed attempt to put the interview with um, the guy who, Guy Yin, forb forbid to mm, mm, give us an interview, so it couldn't be published. <laughs> that was a big thing for me, really. I mean, the podcast was intended to be a constructive look at uh, War Thunder. Was in Intended to be something positive for both the community and the game. Uh, and all we got from Magallin was uh, them ignoring our invitations and uh, just trying to put um, barriers in, in, in the podcast um, edition and forbidding people from giving us interviews. So, afterwards, I really didn't want to make any more. Uh, for a while. I was like, fuck this, I don't feel like doing it. I actually spoke with Bismarck, let's wait for a wait bit before we, we do this. And later I decided that I was going to quit War Thunder. The problem right now is, of course, that's going to be a war, uh, podcast about War Thunder and I'm not flying War Thunder. I'm going to try Grand Forces when I can, but until then, I'm not using War Thunder. So what I'm going to say, I'm mostly... I mean... I don't even look at the forums anymore. I, I'm not up to to the to day to day of the game. What I'm going to say in a podcast about War Thunder if I don't play War Thunder and I, I'm not up to date to what's happening in the game. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense. Doesn't mean that it's not going to come back. It just means that right now I don't see a sense of me being, being part of a podcast of a game I don't play. And I don't really know about anything about. So, I don't know. I guess Viz and I should sit down one day and speak about it and decide what we are going to do. Maybe do a general podcast instead of War Thunder only. I don't know. But for now, um, nothing is decided. So, it's in the air. We don't know. <laughs> Next question. So, Ram, I hear you are done with War Thunder again. Haha, <laughs> you'll be back. Eh, no, I won't. <laughs> That's the easy answer. Um, one of the things that you must understand, guys, is that uh, I'm not 12 years old. Actually, I'm three times at age. When I say I'm stopping something, I'm stopping something. I'm not the rage quitting guy. At least not when I put up a video saying I'm stopping doing something or saying in public that I'm not doing something anymore. Because if I do so, it's because I'm sure I'm going to do so. I'm on record in Facebook saying that I was close to the point that I would quit War Thunder. 
but I actually told Bismarck once uh, in a flight we had together when the bullshit happened, broken fighters, of course, that that was it, that, that I have had it with the game and that War Thunder was history. But that was a pre-bait outburst in the rage of the moment. But after was, I decided that of course I was not moving away from the game at that moment. But if I put something up in a video saying, guys, I'm stopping playing this, it's because I am stopping playing it. I mean, it's not like, oh, I'm raging hard, I'm quitting this game to then two months later come back. It's not that kind of, I'm quitting, no, no. Uh, it's the kind of, this game is so broken that I don't want to play it anymore, at all, at all. The only way that I come back to War Thunder, the air part, uh, because ground forces I'm going to try, as I said, uh, is with Gaijin just turning 180 degrees in the direction they are developing the game. And we all know that's not happening. So, make your own conclusions. No, I'm not coming back to War Thunder. <laughs> Sorry, but no. Next question. So, is any other video for automation coming on the way? I don't know if you saw the new updates. Uh, perhaps we will get uh, uh, an uh, Elite Dangerous Beta soon too. Uh, yes, I have Automation, yes I play it, but the problem with Automation is I don't know why. There are two games that I would love to make content for this for this channel. And really I don't know why or, or how and, and, and why it's happening this way, but I can't. One of them is auto Automation. Uh, the game simply runs so slow in my computer, and I can't figure out why, because if it can run War Thunder, if it can run War Game Island Battle with pretty good graphics as well, why can't it run properly in Automation? I don't get it, but really I get horrible slow uh, answers to, to the clicks and stuff. It's playable, it's playable, and of course I play it. But the problem with that is that when I switch the recorder on, it gets twice as slow. And first, it makes it for an unbearable experience when I'm trying to play the game while recording. And second, it makes for very crap crappy uh, video quality because you will see me trying to click something three times and nothing happen, uh, happening until it happens. I don't know if it's because it's not properly optimized, which probably is the case, of course, it's a game in very early development. Um, but I would, I could do some exhibition videos, very short videos, maybe five minutes, to show some cars I have designed with the engines I have put on them. Um, but the problem is that, other than that, I can't really put the building process in, because really it's unbearable. I tried, and I... Uh, I simply gave up midway because simply it, it, it was crap. It was making a crap of a video. It was really, 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 really bad. Um, so what if someday that game runs properly, I don't know why it's running so slow, but it's, th it's doing so. Uh, I will do more videos about that. In the meantime, I can't. Um, the other game I would love to make content about is a game called Star Sector which is a Java-based game um, on the space, which is awesome, and with mods it's even more awesome. The problem with this game is that I don't know why I can run it fine, at maybe 80 frames per second, but the moment I try to capture, and I tried with Fraps and with DX Story, with both, happened the same. Um, frames per second will go to hell and I start getting 9 frames per second and of course it's unplayable that way and it's impossible to make a proper video about it so I just had to give, give up on the idea of making a let's play of that game which is a game I'm enjoying a lot yeah yeah that's sad but it's the way it goes I don't know what's happening I looked that uh, up for possible reasons and I found absolutely none so I don't know I don't know um, those are two games really and it pains me because both are so 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 great and would make for so great content for this game for this channel but <laughs> when it can happen it can happen and about Elite Dangerous yes of course well I already spoke about it in the 10k special uh, I'm totally looking forward to that I can't wait uh, next question 
another question about the elite dangerous uh, so you aren't in the elite dangerous alpha but are you going to be posting video of their beta states one or two i hope so i hope so the problem with elite is really i'm not in the position to put money in in anything rather uh, i mean i'm without a job um, i have to save for the day today and uh, for all the needs on the day today and that kind of stuff so for me to purchase my way into a beta is nothing I can really do uh, I I'm looking for one and I'm planning to um, play it to get into the beta but to get into the alpha was impossible I mean it was more than a hundred uh, uh, bucks and that's some kind of money I can't spend on a game uh, the bid access is much more affordable and probably I will get in, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you will probably will be seeing content of Elite Dangerous maybe better state. Hopefully, hopefully. No one knows, <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, it's, it's the most probable thing, yeah. Next question. Ram, is the focus when I supposed to overheat after only something like 3 minutes on web? Uh, no. <laughs> Easy. Uh, no one, yes. First, depends on how fast are you going. That's an air cooler engine, and the slower you go, the worse the cooling is going to be, of course. Second, depends on the temperature of the air you are moving through. Uh, the cooler, the most cooling effect you will have on the engine. And finally, you will have to face the limits of the engine itself. Um, the three minutes with web comes with the, from the manual but I'm going to put it this way and uh, the focus one I have basically the same engine in the A5 and the A8 to put an instance okay the A8 had an extra boost system emergency boost system that added 300 uh, horsepower with direct uh, fuel injection to the to the engine um, but basically the engine was the same Okay, the installation installation was also the same. The calling had no changes other than the MG uh, mounts uh, because the A8 had uh, 13 millimeter machine guns and the A5 had 7.92. Uh, and of course, the f it had to be faded and ended up bugging the calling a little bit. But was the engine itself had exactly the same cooling abilities in the A8 and the A5? Now, the A8 with an extra 300 horsepower had a limit of use for those um, 2000 uh, horsepower for 10 minutes in a row uh, the A5 running on 1700 horsepower with the same engine and the same cooling limited to 3 minutes only? no the problem here is the change of um, doctrine in, in the German manuals, so to speak. Uh, the A5 came um, very late in 1942, early 1943, back at a moment where Germany was actually holding its own very well in the air, was arguably actually winning the air battle in most fronts. Uh, they had less numbers, but they were having a lot of kills and losing very few planes. Also, in that stage of the war, Germany wasn't producing a lot of planes. Uh, actually, the production was very limited until 1944, because Germany didn't enter a total war economy until mid-1943. Uh, so, back in... until 1944, actually, German, in the air, in the Luftwaffe, the German doctrine, the German um, politi policy was to um, keep planes on service as long as possible. So the uh, three minutes on web limitation for the manuals was included because they wanted to expand the engine life and to make the planes usable as long as possible because the production numbers weren't so high. Not because the engines would overheat or that the engine would sustain catastrophic uh, failures, not at all. Um, I mean, in 1942, actually, uh, most of the focus Enemies flew with uh, the rated engines, with engines that were intentionally below the top power, because without the top power, they were simply good enough to beat anything they would find, 
and um, it would prolongate and elongate the engine life. Actually, the, the rating happened because of a faulty, faulty uh, fuel, but very early after the introduction of the Focus 180A3. But afterwards, and after the fuel bats problem was solved, the planes still kept on being um, uh, derated until the Spitfire 9 came around. So you can figure out why that limit was put, the 3 minutes with web for the A5. It was simply to prolong the engine life. Uh, the A8, the later uh, Focal Fanini with 2000 horsepower, was limited to 10 minutes on web. And then, with 5 minutes of cooldown, it could use another 10 minutes of web. With exactly the same engine and exactly the same cooling as the A5. W what kind of black magic happened there? I mean, the sweet three. C3 fuel injection provided for some cooling, but that accounted for the extra 3 horse, uh, horsepower, 300 horsepower. So, what kind of black magic did a ma uh, 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 an engine able to take 10 minutes of web in any 44 when arguably only could take 3 in any 43? Well, no black magic. It's yet that just that in any 43 the limit was because of engine life limits and in any 44 the limit was where the actual limit of the engine was and why this change well for starters as i said germany entered a total war economy in any 43 uh, production numbers skyrocketed so suddenly german had a lot of planes available and a lot of engines available and in fact, the problem from 1943 onwards was that Germany had more planes than um, experienced pilots. So they simply threw all the precautions about um, limits and life um, extension measures and uh, simply put the limits where the actual limits were. Um, also, in 1944, Germans were under a much, much higher pressure. The Eighth Air Force. Um, was uh, coming in numbers. Uh, the P-47 had arrived. The P-51 had started flying over Europe. Europe. So suddenly, the Germans found themselves in not as uh, in not the same position as they were in 1942. In 1942, the Germans had the, the better plane. In 1944, the Germans were facing better planes. The P-51 the P-47, etc. So suddenly the, the problem was not we have these planes and we want to keep them in service as long as possible. First, because we have as many planes as we want. We are producing them in huge, huge, huge numbers. And second, the pilot we lose is going to go, be gone forever and we can't replace it. So now our limits are the actual limits of the plane. In other words, the focus went in EF5 shouldn't overheat uh, uh, after three minutes of web. No, <laughs> that's the short version. The explanation I already gave you, but yeah, no, no, it shouldn't. Uh, but yeah, yeah, what other? What are you going to say? Next question. Ram, can you tell us some Spanish tradition on, on Christmas holidays? Uh, well, that's this, of course, was asked on, on Christmas. Well, I think the biggest difference from the Spanish Christmas, so to speak, and the one in most of the rest of the nations which celebrate the Christmas, of course, because not all of them do, is a um, Christian uh, holiday. So, yeah, I think the biggest one is that Christmas for us is not over after um, New Year's Eve. For us, uh, Christmas lasts until the 6th of January, which is the day of uh, the um, kings, the Re Reyes Magos, the would be kind of the wizard kings in, in, in English. It follows, follows the lore of the three um, kings from the Orient, which came to uh, Belen to uh, give presents to baby Jesus. And it's a Spanish tradition that 
uh, we don't have Santa Claus. We don't have um, presents on uh, December uh, 25th. Instead, we have them on January 6th. Well, actually, that's the Spanish tradition. Lately, what's happening more and more is that um, people have uh, presents on Santa Claus and they don't have them on 6th of January. We are losing that tradition slowly but sl <coughs> and slowly. Uh, what also happens in some case, cases, a lot of them, is that uh, you get presents both <laughs> from Santa Claus and both from the kings. So you will have presents on um, the uh, Christmas Day and on January 6th. Um, in our case, in our family, uh, we follow the tradition, so it's presents in 6th of January only. Um, that's I think that's the biggest change because for for us Christmas is all the way until the sixth of January, while in most of the rest of the nations, once New Year's Eve happens, it's over. Um, as for traditions, I don't know. We have traditions in our family, but I don't know if they are family traditions more than Christmas traditions for Spain. Uh, we have a huge. Um, um, tree, Christmas tree, which of course happens in all the nation, but we also do a little uh, Belen, which is a little um, representation of uh, where well, what happened in Christmas with uh, a little portal with um, Jesus, the the animals, the uh, um, their parents, uh, the Virgin Mary, the the pastor, the yeah, I mean, all the representation of, of, of that. And in my case, it's pretty huge. I mean, my mother is a <coughs> loves to do it, and he makes huge balloons. I mean, like this this um, this particular Christmas, uh, it took all the hall of our, our our house in in Bilbao. Uh, in that, in our house in Bilbao, we have two mm, doors. One is the proper hall, and the other goes directly into the kitchen. And from the kitchen, you can enter the house. Um, well, all the hall was taken by that. So to enter the house, you had to go through the kitchen. Um, it's mass. It was massive and beautiful, beautiful, really, really beautiful. Uh, she puts a lot of effort on that, and of course, uh, when my nephews come home, they love it. And it's, it's really a, a fantastic tradition. Um, and I think it's one that is slowly but slowly getting lost. I mean, I don't see that kind of balance being put up in any other house or family. But it's beautiful, beautiful. I wish I could, I, I have taken a couple of pics so you guys could see it. Uh, for next year, I will, I promise. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, we have some particular... Particularly in the Basque country, actually, now I think of it, we do have Santa Claus. <laughs> uh, but a regional version of Santa Claus, which, uh, Santa Claus, which is called the Olenchero. Um, which comes also in the Christmas Day. Uh, I mean, there are very special traditions all around Spain. In, in different places, there are different traditions. So it's not like as we have a national tradition other than the 6th of January, which is pretty much in all, in, in all of, of Spain. So, yeah, there's more, but I, I, I don't want to speak maybe 15 minutes about that. There are more questions to answer, but yeah, th those are some of them. Um, next question. Ram, do you happen to know of any reported cases of bomber accidentally dropping bombs on flight aircraft? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, actually, there are a series of um, pictures about a B-17 dropping bombs over other B-17. Uh, the other B-17 uh, got the one of their horizontal stabilizers uh, ripped away and it actually fell off the sky. Uh, it was actually because the I think the reason why it happened is because the lower B-17 was out of place in the formation. And when that happened, of course, bombs could drop uh, on your plane. So, yes, it happened. And um, if you... Uh, I'm not going to put a link about that because uh, I don't know if the image, uh, images will be copyrighted. But uh, hold on a second and I will tell you which words to look in YouTube to see those, those images. 
Okay, if you go to Google and you enter the, well, you go to the images section and you enter B17 bomb hitting plane, uh, you will find the images I'm talking about. Uh, you can see clearly the stream of bombs going through the the horizontal stabilizer, the left horizontal stabilizer of the lower uh, B17. Um, yeah, it happened, and it actually happened quite some times. Um, running out of formation in American bomber formations was really, really, really dangerous. Not only because you would get uh, less cover from the defensive firepower, but because you could be under other B-17 when the moment came to drop the bombs. Um, so yeah, also, also, believe it or not, Germans bombed uh, bomber formations. They had a 250 kilogram bombs bomb with a um, timed fuse, so they would go over the bomber formation, drop the bomb, and hopefully would explode in the middle of the formation and, and at least uh, shake off the the pilots and make them break formation for a while, and so making them easier targets for the normal fighters. They weren't really successful, um, and actually they weren't used a lot after 1943, but actually it happened. They dropped bombs on on the, um, bomber formations. Yes, they did. As for any of them actually hitting, I don't know. <laughs> I know they were very, very unreliable and they w didn't have any success at all in the sense of, I mean, they stopped doing that because it simply was not having a huge effect. Um, so I, I don't know how su much success uh, in killing planes he, he had or how many planes did the Germans kill, excuse me, with bombs. But yeah, it happened. It happened. Next question. And this question was not the last, but he left it uh, for the end because it's probably the toughest one someone has asked me. Not in the sense that I don't have an answer to, but in the sense that I don't know if I want to answer it. Um, here's an off-topic but tough question uh, for you that I would love to hear you speak about RAM. Most people, including me, don't know Spanish history, especially recent one. Um, actually, most of us have no clue about it, and certainly the most important figure of this recent Spanish history must have been Franco. A highly controversial figure, people actually virtually know nothing about him, and even for those who know about him, the debate is far from being over. Therefore, I would be highly interested to have the point of view of a Spaniard and a history addict, Spaniard addict, about this highly controversial figure that marked Spain's 20th century. Also, of course, because you didn't directly live through that era, maybe if you could tell the different opinions of your elders, basically grandparents, have about him, uh, uh, hearing about that, it would be great. Cheers. <sighs> A topic I would love to speak about for minutes, hours, days. But here we have a fundamental problem, and it's that I don't want to speak about politics, even less Spanish politics. Reason for that is that if you think you're whatever nation you live in, politics are crap, you don't know Spain. Um, I honestly think the only reason why Spain is not in a civil war right now is because there's a huge middle class and people really don't live that bad today, which was not the case in 1936. In 1936 what it happened was that there were very few people having almost all the resources and all the riches, richness of the country, a very small very very small middle class and a huge low class and that was basically why what happened in the end today that the only reason why i'm sure that nothing like that is happening is because people are just living way too good to get to an armory get some rifles and killing each other because the extremism is so hard Entering a political discussion in Spain in a group of, let's say, 10 people of different procedences is a hymn of to being destroyed. Because there is no middle ground. And if you are in the middle ground, you are one of the few, you are going to be put in the extreme. 
whether you want it or not. I take myself as a more or less being in the middle, maybe middle, slightly to the right of the political um, spectrum. I have very widely different ideas from very widely different things. Some of them are more akin to the leftist, for instance, my stance mm, about the... Um, um, no, I'm, I'm not going to even say anything about it. I'm there. Well, the problem of being there is that leftist people are going to say you are a fascist. A people who sit on the right are going to say that you are a communist. Or a leftist, at least. Uh, there are so many, so few people in the middle that being there is automatically getting labeled as one or another depending on who you are talking to. Uh, really, this nation is a nation of extremes. And the political class also is, po is totally corrupt, which is totally besides the point. Um, Speaking about Franco would put me in a very, very bad pot, spot. Because... First, he's speaking about politics and I don't want to speak about politics in a YouTube video. I, I don't have a problem speaking this in private. But not in public. I have my own ideas about him. I'm not going to say if they are good or bad. If I think he was a great man or an absolute son of a bitch. Um, if you know me, probably you would guess that my view on him is pretty neutral. And there, okay, I said it, it's pretty neutral. He had light and sails. He was a positive influence and a negative influence at the same time. Um, but I'm not going to say more tha than that about it. It's sad, but really. I, I don't want to get into politics in this channel, really, I don't. If we ever get the chance to have a private conversation, I will speak about it all you want. But no, no, not not, not giving my personal opinion about him, uh, other than what I said. As for um, the experiences of my elders, sadly, all my grandparents have passed away. Uh, both my granddads uh, and my grandmothers um, but of course I got to hear some stories from them and also from my dad and my mom about what had happened back then from the most part I don't know a lot about my granddad from my mother mostly because he had such a bad um, experience uh, in the civil war and afterwards that he just wouldn't speak about it. So it's mostly a huge mystery what happened to him. But some must be something really, 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 really bad. Um, as for my granddad through my father, it's actually a funny story if it wasn't as sad as what it is. Uh, my grandfather wa lived actually for 25 years under a death sentence, believe it or not. The only thing that didn't get him in, in front of a fighting squad is that he had close ties and was very close to, to the civil administrator of the li uh, city he, he lived in, in, which was Salamanca. My granddad was a doctor and uh, was a doctor... Um, because he got his degree from the re Republic. But one of the first things that happened when Franco got to the power was that all the degrees gotten uh, under the Republic were declared void. So he had to get his degree again. So for starters, he couldn't be a doctor for a while until he got his degree again. Of course, didn't take him long, but still, he, he had two degrees on, on medicine, which is pretty great. Um, but yeah, he got sentences to death. My granddad was mostly a political, for all I know. But his brother wasn't. His brother was actually leftist. And I don't know exactly the details, but something his brother made got him into trouble and got him into the line of the ones who had to be brought into a, a death fighting squad. 
And um, yeah, as I said, well, he got away with it, first of all, because everyone knew he really didn't have anything to do with that, with whatever it was. And second, because he had really close ties and was friends with the civil administrator of uh, the son of Salamanca. So instead, what he got was basically uh, being um, sent out. He couldn't put a step on a big city because then he would be um, arrested and probably I'm not going to say that that sentence would be carried on but he would be in a serious mess if that happened so basically he got away with um, moving out of the city and yes if you hear a dog that's my dog um, he got away with moving out of the city and going to go some god forbidden uh, towns uh, in the middle of nowhere so instead of having a decent life uh, as a doctor, he has to uh, live in a forbidden mm, town down in the middle of nowhere, very close to the Portuguese um, uh, frontier. And uh, he was basically the doctor of three different towns, which were maybe 40 kilometers one from another. And he had no car, so he had to use his horse to go there and all of that to earn very little and he had four kids and a wife and they were poor, poor as rats um, it was a very tough time for, for my dad and uh, yeah well it really was not that great and I said it would be funny if it wasn't, if it wasn't sad because of uh, what happened in, uh, I think it was 1969, uh, because of the 13th year, or was 1966, I don't know. I, I know it was a, a significant year where they were commemorating the 30 years after the success of the uprising, the, the national uprising, the Alzamiento Nacional, the, the way that um, the rebellion was called uh, by Franco and, and the, well, the Frankists. And uh, to commemorate that, they issued a general amnesty for all those um, who had a penalty on their head, maybe they were in prison, maybe not, but still they had, um, they were pursued. Um, they would be amnestied if they would submit a reading uh, to, I don't know exactly what, but they had to send it to some organization or some, I don't know. The thing is, they had to send a letter written and signed by their own hand where they would say that and they would uh, wholeheartedly uh, agree and uh, attach themselves to the national movement and that they um, share the ideals of the glorious uprising of 1936 and uh, long life to La Franco, all that stuff. You know the deal. So basically, if you write it and if you were to write that letter, sign it, and send it, you would get an amnesty. And of course, when my father and my uh, uncles uh, got knew of that, they immediately told my grandfather. Father, father, now you have the chance to come back to Salamanca. You only have to do this. And my father, or grandfather, basically told you, fuck you all. I'm not reading this piece of bullshit l full of lies. Franco can go to hell for all I care and fuck the national movement and fuck them all. Well, it was <laughs> kind of complicated. Let's say that my grandfather had a character. Most of my family does, uh, <laughs> including me. Um, yeah, basically he, he told them to solve the idea up there. Yeah, there. Uh, and then he was not ever going to read uh, something like that. Uh, because, no, of course, I mean, it was understandable. For 30 years, his life had been destroyed. And um, without him having anything to do with that because he was in trouble not because of him in the first instance but because of his brother um, he was a political but hated Franco for a reason of course anyway after long 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 conversations and a 
pretty lengthy process of convincing him. Finally, he had, he, he admitted to. He said, okay, okay. Because, of course, he couldn't get away from the fact that if he did that and he get the amnesty, he could go back to the city and earn a decent living as a doctor in the city, opening a consulting in his own house, which is what he did afterwards. Um, but if I recall correctly, I don't know exactly because I was told this when I was a kid. Um, but I think the letter was actually written by my dad and my uncles. He refused to put that on paper. He just got the paper, didn't even read it, put the sign and told my uh, dad and uncles, okay, then you can send it. But didn't even read it. He had so much hatred for Franco and the national movement and all that stuff. Um, there are a lot of stories about that, of course. I mean, all families do have stories. Um, personally, uh, I would say that my family didn't have it easy. Uh, actually, no family had it easy in the Civil War. And it's sad that even nowadays people don't learn from the past in this country. But whatever, this is all I'm going to say about it. Um, as for politics, I'm not going to enter into that anymore. Uh, reason being that, first of all, this is a gaming channel, not a politics channel. And second of all, because really, at least in this country, uh, you can speak about politics without getting in a, into a huge, huge, huge argument. And uh, I'm not going to say that it's going to be a violent argument, but it's going to be an argument. And in some cases, and with some people, it can be an argument with violence included. Not in the physical sense, but with serious, serious, serious word being, words being uttered. Um, I've given up speaking in politics in, in public. Really, the Spanish average guy, I can tell you, is the f most friendly guy you will ever find. He's funny, he's charming, for the most part. Um, it's really a laugh to go out with, to, to get some drinks with. Um, he's generous, he's, he's all of that. You can speak about mostly anything with him, but don't don't ever touch politics ever ever word of advice ever if you meet a spaniel don't ask him about politics <laughs> don't because uh, there's a high chance he's one of the people who is in the streams uh, because very few of us are in the middle at least is how i see it anyway that's going to be it for this week guys um Thank you again for being there. Remember to uh, post uh, the questions you want to see answered, to um, upvote those questions you want to see answered the most. And uh, well, as always, thank you very much for watching and see you later.